Welcome to this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic. As we approach the date in April when Vice Chancellor Slites is due to render his decision on this case, we decided to take on one more witness in these proceedings, and it is the woman that Elon Musk threw under the bus on his first day of testimony as the supposed leader of the deal from the Tesla side. Robin Denholm was named by Musk during his testimony as the Tesla board member given the task of overseeing this bailout on behalf of the Tesla shareholders. She is also the woman who has since become the chair of the Tesla board after the SEC removed Musk from that position as part of his 2018 fraud settlement, the one Musk is currently trying to overturn, but Judge Edward Chen overseeing this action is having none of Musk's nonsense. Given the absolute disaster that this bailout transaction turned into for Tesla, and the fact that Denholm currently sits as the lead figurehead on the board of this trillion dollar company that still swings as wildly as a penny stock, the primary goal of this episode is to determine if Denholm was complicit in this transaction, doing Musk's bidding, or simply completely incompetent with regards to the task at hand. Given the end result and what happened to Solar City, these really are the only two options available. Denholm's direct examination is taken from trial document 467 as found on the website plainsight.org. One thing that we found very interesting right off the kick with this witness, who also settled prior to this trial through the available DNO insurance to cover her own ass, is that Evan Chesler, the lawyer who conducted the direct examination of Musk, also does the direct for Denholm. But where the direct examination of Musk, the sole defendant now in this class action, took a mere 37 pages from pages 7 to 44, Dan Holmes' direct examination by Musk's lawyer takes 127 pages, starting on page 1944, ending the next day on page 2075. In comparison, even the cross-examination of Dan Holmes by plaintiff's lawyer Berger was less than 100 pages. Due to the length of her time on the stand, we're going to do our best to compress her testimony into an easy-to-follow summation. So here we go. As he did with Musk, Chesler starts off with Dan Holmes' backstory. Dan Holm, as mentioned, has been the chair at Tesla since November of 2018. She was first brought aboard at Tesla in 2014 as the new chair of their audit committee. However, if you go to the Tesla website and look at their board of directors page, Dan Holm is not listed as the chair of the board here, and she doesn't even appear in the leadership column of the page. Her educational background is a bachelor's in economics from the University of Sydney with a major in accounting and industrial relations. She also has a master's in commerce, majoring in management accounting, graduating from the University of New South Wales in 1999. Starting in August of 2007, Dan Holmes started working for Juniper Networks in California as CFO for nine years, leaving in the summer of 2016. Dan Holm tells Chesser she was involved in roughly 10 company acquisitions while with Juniper, involved in the background during those negotiations. From there, she moved back to Australia to take a position as COO at Telstra in November of 2016, which she compares to AT&T as being the largest telecommunications network provider in Australia. She moved into the CFO role after 18 months. You'll notice that these officer positions overlap with Denholm's association on the board of directors at Tesla. This would include her current stint as Tesla chair, since she took that position in November of 2018 and didn't leave Telstra until June of 2019. She goes on to say she was on other boards as well, such as ABB, which she calls the European equivalent to GE, where she sat on their board from April 2016 to April 2017, and before that at Echelon Corporation from February 2008 to 2013. The interesting part is, the area shaded in grey on this timeline is when the negotiations were taking place for this bailout transaction, meaning at the time she was sitting on up to three different boards simultaneously. Oh, and as was widely reported, Denholm took a year off to play golf and travel with her husband after leaving Juniper before getting the gig with Telstra, which she called an offer too good to refuse. That would be this gap right here, where she was traveling and playing golf. So at the end of the day, Robin Denholm is a professional board hopper who landed at Tesla in 2014. She was approached by Brad Buss, who was at the time the chair of Tesla Audit Committee, although she gets quite confused with when that was, first mentioning 2016, then 2006, then 2014 until she gets it right, once Vice Chancellor Slight suggested she get her date straight. At the time of the Solar City bailout, Dan Holm was entrenched in Tesla as the chair of the audit committee. She was also on the compensation committee and on the NOM and Gov nomination and governance committee. Given that Tesla's board has shrunk to seven people from the 11 people it was at this time, fair to say not a lot of work being done by the nomination committee. Denholm declares her compensation for these positions was $45,000 per year cash and stock options for both her board service and committee service as well. She conveniently leaves out how many stock options that would have included. 
When prompted by Chesler, Denholm also states she was not financially dependent upon her board service compensation, had no financial stake in Solar City, and did not sit on the Solar City or SpaceX boards. Of course, she was already sitting on a bunch of other boards as well at other companies, so you know, time and a day, right? From here, Chesler starts asking Denholm about Musk, when they met, what she thought about his leadership style, and whether or not he exerted any influence over her with regards to this transaction. She answers all these questions in the negative, so we'll see if those answers hold up under cross. Now we're talking about meetings, starting with the March 2015 meeting at the Panasonic Gigafactory in Nevada. She tries telling the court that there was a discussion at that time about Tesla acquiring a solar company. We've been down this road before and neither Musk nor his brother Kimball could provide meeting minutes to corroborate this story, so again, expect this to be disputed in cross. Even though Chesler, in anticipation of that argument, asks his witness again under oath if this executive session took place, and Denholm says it did, nobody could provide any proof whatsoever of that meeting, nor any mention of solar companies in general at meetings which followed. It's worth noting that Denholm states at this time the Gigafactory was still under construction and not producing batteries. Yet Kimball's recollection starting on line 15, page 453, was that the factory was up and running and they even walked the roof to get a feel of the scale. Two rather different recollections of the day to say the least. Moving to February of 2016, Denholm is asked about her recollection of a special board meeting discussing a potential solar acquisition. JX849 are the minutes of this special meeting, page 1 reading, potential acquisition. And under that heading, the suggestion that there had been a previous discussion on March 3, 2015 about a solar acquisition. Again, as we've seen the plaintiff's lawyer confirm with other witnesses, there's no mention of a solar acquisition at that 2015 meeting, no mention in the minutes, so we are going to skip over this little bit of fiction. Chesler starts asking Denholm about Tesla Energy and when it was formed. Denholm gives three dates, only one of which was right, and it was April of 2015. And right after this, Chesler asks again about JX849 and how in this exhibit there was a discussion about how the acquisition of Solar City was part of this report. Pretending to the court that this was proof there had been previous discussion about the synergies of the two companies. Here's the problem with that line of questioning. JX849 is the first presentation that Musk had his co-opted team quickly whip up over the weekend by phone while Musk was on a ski vacation in Lake Tahoe with Lyndon Rive. This February 2016 meeting is the first instance in any board meeting minutes when the acquisition of a solar company was discussed. Chesler has attempted to misdirect the court's attention back to 2015 and the creation of Tesla Energy, which was for the production of the Powerwall, with when Musk needed the board to bail him and his cousins out at Solar City during the spring of the following year. Now, Denholm tries to tell the court that the synergies being discussed were about how to bring a complete residential solar package to the marketplace. However, that conversation would have been pure nonsense, since SolarCity was only ever a solar panel installer and not a solar panel manufacturer. SolarCity picked up whatever cheap panels they could from other companies, including Cosera, REC Group, Trina Solar, Canadian Solar, Hanwha Q-Cells, and LG Electronics. There was nothing proprietary about Solar City installations to buy to create a complete package for the consumer. Even after Solar City partnered up with Panasonic and Giga Buffalo, Solar City, now Tesla Energy, still used the cheapest panels they could find in China instead of the products being made by Panasonic. Which is why Panasonic had to find other buyers in Asia and eventually pulled completely out of Buffalo. Now at the end of this meeting, as previously discussed, Musk's proposal was denied by the board because Tesla already had enough problems on their hands with the Model X assembly line and the upcoming Model 3 launch. Next up is JX1049, Tesla first quarter update for 2016. Tesla brings up this exhibit right after discussing the February 29th meeting, meaning to connect these events, but the shareholder letter he's now referring to was released on May 4th, 2016, over two months later, but he fails to mention that gap. So Tesla is again mucking around with the dates on these backstories, hoping people aren't catching on. A bunch of irrelevant discussion goes on for a number of pages about Model X production. So the one thing we'll take away from this exhibit is that nowhere in the shareholders letter released in May is there any mention of the company seeking to buy Solar City or any other solar company. Yet when Musk and Linden start scheming about this deal, Musk told his cousins in February he would have this transaction done by May. Yet not a peep of this was printed in the shareholder letter. Now on pages 1961 and 2, Chesler starts asking Denholm questions about JX1131, the board meeting minutes from May 31st of 2016. Chesler has conveniently skipped over the March 15th meeting where Musk tried for the second time in two weeks to convince the board to move forward with Solar City. 
This meeting was the third time that Musk presented to Tesla to bail him out at Solar City and the instance where they caved into his demands. The board authorized management to instruct Wachtell Lipton to undertake a review of the potential acquisition by the company, which was convenient because Musk brought those folks with him to the meeting, having already retained them. We know this from Musk's cross-examination. So when Denholm tells the court she didn't believe Musk had any role in retaining Wachtell, she's either oblivious or being deceitful. Wachtell was handpicked by Musk, and Gracias and Marin, as confirmed by Musk. For financial advisors on this deal, Denholm says she was involved with picking Evercore, but we already know that Kimball had previous dealings with Evercore with regards to his business transactions. So if anything, this is only partially true for Denholm. Denholm states that Evercore's assigned roles included having a look at the universe of companies that were potential acquisition targets. But of course, the only company that they looked at in any depth was Solar City. Chesser asks his witness why Evercore was tasked with looking at the solar industry more broadly in May, and Denholm states, We wanted to make sure that we acquired the right company for Tesla over the long term. And if that was the truth of the matter, they could not have done a worse job, or picked a worse company to acquire. As it was, Evercore had their hands full just trying to make heads or tails out of the dumpster fire that was Solar City. Denholm states that she was aware of the daily calls between Musk and Evercore's due diligence team and that she participated in many of them. She was also apparently aware that Musk made calls without her, and that didn't concern her at all, even though Musk had supposedly been recused. This exchange is noteworthy. Chesler, did you have any interest one way or the other in Mr. Musk being informed or updated on the progress of the events, the negotiations? Denholm, no it didn't. It wouldn't surprise me, and it didn't surprise me at the time. Given that he was to be the CEO of the integrated company, should we proceed with the actual acquisition, it would have been important for him to be involved. So Robin Denholm has just announced to the court and to the world that she has no idea what recused means. Also, why should it automatically be assumed Musk would be the CEO of the integrated company? Musk knew next to nothing about the solar industry as proven by the abject financial failure of Solar City under his watch as chair. What's worse, his cousins Peter and Lyndon Rive were given cushy posts at Tesla after this bailout, even though they too were complicit in the failure of their company. Lyndon became head of sales and service at Tesla Energy. He lasted about six months. Peter was appointed VP in charge of solar products, in charge of developing the imaginary solar roof tiles. He quit in July of 2017 after only eight months. He left to explore new opportunities. Apparently, he's still exploring for them. Chesler goes to JX1228 where he asked Denholm to describe for us what your understanding was of the recusal of Mr. Elon Musk and Mr. Gracias with respect to this transaction. Denholm answers, so they could be there during discussions. And in fact, I found it helpful in particularly some of the technical discussions around the product, but that they were to be recused for any of the vote in terms of the transaction itself or the pricing around the transaction in terms of any vote on the pricing. That is a completely different story than the one Kimball was peddling. Remember, Kimball couldn't recall his brother or Garcia's being in the room for these discussions. Yet Denholm actually needs to have them in the room to help her understand the basics of the deal, which completely ends the debate whether or not Musk was in the room during critical discussions at this meeting, as was recorded by the Evercore team. Chesser brings up a new exhibit, JX1231, the discussion materials from the June 20, 2016 meeting prepared by Evercore, where they did some very basic analysis on three solar competitors. The board and Evercore determined, using these materials, that SolarCity was a better company than the three other companies, one of whom they actually provided no data for. The other two that are mentioned are Sunrun and Vivent. Vivent Solar on June 20th of 2016 was trading at 335 on 126 million shares outstanding, giving it a market cap of $422 million. The last day it was traded, before it was merged into another company, it closed at $43.08, with a market cap of $5.4 billion, a six-year increase of 1,285%. And the company it merged with was Sunrun, who is now the largest residential solar installer in North America. In other words, if Evercore actually thought Solar City was a superior company to acquire, they completely dropped the ball. Or, and this is far more likely, Musk was telling them during their daily update calls exactly how to direct the board. Which is probably related to why George Belichick said during his testimony that he was very glad to be on the other side of this transaction. Chesler asked about various portions of the Evercore presentation, which we don't have. There is a ballpark chart, the discounted equity value analysis, and the SOTP valuation, SOTP short for some of the parts. There was also a premium paid analysis. These were all based on public information and included no due diligence. And as we know from Musk's testimony, the public information at Solar City was quite different from reality. 
a reality that Musk was fully aware of. The SOTP broke SolarCity into two distinct parts, the development company, or DEVCO, and the generation company, which were supposedly evaluated independently based on the June 17th stock price close of 2132. In this analysis of various methodologies, Denholm stated the stock was undervalued, indicating a premium on the currently traded stock price. Conversation moves to reference points, the first being a range of Wall Street analyst price targets who put the price target of SolarCity between $18 and $50, when their 52-week spread was between $16.67 and $60. SolarCity was much closer to the 52-week low than it was the high from August 5th the previous year, the only instance for a single day where the shares closed above $60. The 1667 52-week low came on February 11th of 2016, nine days after the company's meeting where liquidity and covenant concerns were first raised. Tesla on June 20th was trading at 219.70 adjusted, so a straight-across buy at market value would have been very close to a 10 to 1 swap at 10.3. And despite Denholm saying this would somehow help Tesla in their negotiations at the time, that certainly doesn't appear to be the case in the final analysis. The proxy label JX2121 stated, The Tesla board then discussed with representatives of Evercore and Tesla management matter related to a potential acquisition of SolarCity, including potential customers, product and operational synergies between the companies, the financial and capital profile and valuation of SolarCity, the structure and timing of a potential acquisition, and the due diligence that would need to be conducted on SolarCity following a potential preliminary acquisition proposal. From page 1983 to page 1986, there's a discussion about various assessments of the Devco business side and the Powerco business side. But since the company was an abject financial failure on both sides, we're going to skip over this part to page 1987, where the discussion turns to the range they might offer based on this assessment before due diligence was ever started. The currency of this sale would be Tesla stock in a stock-for-stock -stock transaction, requiring an exchange ratio based on the stock prices of the respective companies. JX1238 is the set of notes taken by the Evercore associate at that June 20th meeting. On page 2, Robin asked the room a question. What's the best way to arrive at specific prices? Stu Francis from Evercore stated that FF, presumably financial forecast, indicates mid to high 20s, 30-day premium. Musk then says, as recorded, 30% over the 4-week trailing average for 28.50. This is stated again on the next page where Denholm says, I recall Elon suggesting or inputting that 30% on the chart was roughly equal to 2850. And since he's not a fan of ranges, according to Denholm, 2850 would have been Musk's number. A range downward of $2 to accommodate discovery and due diligence was settled on. Now throughout this conversation, neither Chesler nor Denholm made any mention whatsoever of the numbers that Evercore presented during the meeting, which was a range of 21 to 23 according to Kimball, and neither made any mention of Kimball supposedly supporting that lower range either, as he testified during his time on the stand. But both of them confirmed that 2850, that specific number, was presented by Musk during the meeting as the basis for a stock-for-stock -stock conversion ratio, which are spoken about on page 1994, with Chesler translating the 2850 to 2650 into 1.22 to 1.31 as the ratio. But if the board had just gone out that day, cashed in shares of Tesla, and bought shares in SolarCity, the ratio was 0.103 at full market retail relative to share prices of both companies on June 20th, 2016. Chesser asks one more question before the break. How was this bid, the proposed acquisition, communicated to SolarCity? And Denholm tells the court, Todd Marin was tasked with drafting a letter that was to be presented to SolarCity. And this is where the court breaks for afternoon recess at 3.05 p.m. After the break, Chesler asks Denholm about the public reaction to the announced bailout, and she states the reaction was mixed. JX1374 is an analyst report of the move by Avondale Partners, who were on the positive side of the bailout, one paragraph of their cover page reading, The combination of Tesla Motors and SolarCity is inevitable, offers attractive financial returns to shareholders of both companies, and creates a renewable energy leader that is uniquely positioned to catalyze a transformation of the energy and transportation industries. Dan Holm asserts this opinion was representative of those in favor of the bailout. JX1301 is presented, which is a similar report from Barclays, but this one was not at all favorable. A lean, mean cash-burning machine for Tesla, a lifeline for SolarCity. While no doubt the Tesla bulls will hail the combination as visionary, we believe the assumption of another $2.6 billion of debt to fold in a solar company with limited synergies and uncertain growth cash prospects only reinforces our negative view of Tesla. Dan Holm asserts this sentiment was consistent among those who were against the deal. Comparing these two opinions, knowing what we know now about the financial situation at SolarCity, you can quite clearly see which of the analyst companies knew what the hell they were talking about. 
Chesler asked Stanholm directly, if the due diligence had ultimately shown that the risks to Tesla of acquiring Solar City outweighed the benefits, how would you have voted on this transaction? And she replies under oath, I would not have voted to go forward with the transaction. But here's the issue with that statement. Denholm herself participated in a lot of that due diligence. As she says, all the way from helping the team and reviewing what the team had come up with in terms of the initial due diligence questions that they were answering, all the way through to sitting in many of the due diligence report outs that were happening throughout the process. She claims to have been that intricately involved in the process. Yet we know from the forensic accounting performed by Ernst & Young post bailout that Solar City was completely insolvent at the time of the deal. So again, either Denholm is completely incompetent, or, giving her the benefit of the doubt, she was not provided with all the information required for performing proper due diligence, or she was simply going to rubber stamp this bailout from the very beginning, regardless of what shortcomings were discovered. Moving on, JX1417 are the special meeting minutes from July 5, 2016, including members from Wachtell and Evercore. There is discussion about the finances and short-term liquidity needs at Solar City. Denholm tries telling the court that Solar City was in the process of raising some capital prior to the offer and that they halted this process because of the due diligence that was underway and the private offer that was out there. Whether or not Denholm knew this was a lie, we do. We know from George Bilicek that Solar City had absolutely no such prospects in the works. They had tried reworking existing debt, approaching buyers using a pipe arrangement. They had tried everything including shopping Solar City to other potential buyers, but nobody wanted to touch this company, no matter how thick the gloves were. Chesser continues, Ms. McBean then discussed with the directors the company's diligence of Solar City thus far and the areas in which further diligence review was still ongoing, and directors noted specific topics the company should diligence in addition to the general ongoing diligence review. Denholm's recollection of this was, the board asked for all of the information around all of the indebtedness of Solar City, the covenants and any additional information around the capital raising or any of the debt they had outstanding. She says they also asked about the Riverbend factory known now as Giga Buffalo or Giga 2, most likely not realizing at the time that this property is not, and has never been, owned by Solar City or subsequently by Tesla. At this time, Riverbend was to be rented to a company called Solivo, acquired by Solar City the previous summer to produce Tesla-branded solar panels. The deal with Panasonic, which changed everything surrounding the Buffalo Billions deal with Governor Cuomo, wasn't announced until October, just before the shareholders vote, upon which this deal was contingent. So whatever information was dug up on that topic was a complete waste of time. JX1404 is a document headed Project Dataless, originally Icarus, which contained a section labeled High Priority Diligence Question List. This document's date is not mentioned, but presumably it is early July of 2016. The document prepared by Dan Holm and her team also claims to have looked into financing and all documents evidencing any material credit arrangements at Solar City or any of its subsidiaries. Chesser asks, why so focused on the diligence effort of all the non-public borrowing information and credit arrangements? And her reply is as follows. So again, the financing arrangement, credit arrangements, were really important to understand, because should we go ahead with the acquisition, then we would, as Tesla, be liable for anything that SolarCity had entered into. The other reason, in my experience, going through these types of arrangements, there may be contingent liabilities or other types of covenants that you can use as part of the negotiations with the other side in terms of the pricing which you pay for the acquisition. All of which is absolutely textbook perfect for an answer. But if we can just take an aside here for a second to refresh our memories. At the beginning of her direct examination, Robin Denholm declared she had a bachelor's in economics with a major in accounting and industrial relations, a master's in commerce with a major in management accounting. She is also a Fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Australia and a member of the Institute of Company Directors of Australia. She has served on half a dozen boards, often as the CFO or COO. On paper, she should have been more than qualified to ferret out shortcomings of the financial health of this failing company. So what possible excuse can this woman have for not being able to discover what other analysts and forensic accountants had no trouble finding? Again, and this goes back to our opening question. Is Robin Denholm incompetent, or is she complicit with regards to executing this bailout? We are about halfway through Denholm's direct examination and haven't been able to answer that question yet. So we're going to take a break at this point, and we'll be back with part two of the direct as soon as you click this button. <laughs> 